Um, if you guys are just joining us, uh, this is Sure with Shake Up. I'm Matt Weinglass here with our uh, special guest correspondent, Nico Kariaku, uh, journalist and screenwriter. And we're going to continue the discussion right now. We're going to actually move over into a topic that came up earlier, and we're going to dive more into that. And it's the anti-war movement. We're going to we're going to take that on right now. Uh, Nico, I want to I'm going to play another clip here, and I, I'll love your feedback on this. But this was us in um dc starting the the documentary shoot i went out there with uh with martin markovitz and we went and we met up with some uh very um amazing uh, uh influential journalists and activists um who had stuff to say and we met up with one of uh your friends um max blumenthal from the gray zone and it was incredible to to meet with him during this rally that took place it was the anti-war rally in washington dc and uh, I had a chance to talk with him. And so um, let's let's go ahead and play uh, play this clip of Max. And he also gave a great speech. So uh, I put a little we put a little thing together for you guys uh, of Max talking to us and talking to the crowd. And uh, yeah, let's see what Max had to say. Max Blumenthal of the Gray Zone. Check it out. We started seeing a lot of smearing going on where they're like creating these websites, these fake websites calling everybody Russian Putinists. It, it really got our blood boiling. Like, what do you what do you think about like is, has that always been the case or is it happening more now? Well, I haven't seen those websites, but it makes perfect sense based on how I've been smeared since I started speaking out against the new Cold War in 2014. I was one of the first, you know, progressive journalists in alternative and online media to start writing about the plague of neo-Nazism in post-Maidan Ukraine. And ever since then, they've called me a Putin puppet and said that Russia is behind the gray zone, that I was recruited by Russia. And, uh, I'm not so I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. I'm not surprised by it. And what you're seeing out here is just everyone out here sees through all of that. And anyone who believes any of that wouldn't be here anyway. It's so tragic to me that this rally has come under attack, not only by the usual suspects in the corporate media, but by sectarian forces that parade as progressive and anti-war. They say that right and left should not come together, that our petty differences must define and divide us, and that this rally is a danger to the movement. Well, let me speak now as a journalist who's met and lived with people on the other side of the guns of US empire. Let me speak about the Palestinians I met in the rubble of Gaza who'd seen their families wiped out by US made missiles and howitzers fired by Israel's apartheid army simply because they dared to resist their dispossession. Let me speak to you about the Syrian people I met in Damascus who'd seen their cities surrounded by NATO backed jihadist militias and who now withstand Israeli bombs and sadistic US sanctions. Let me talk to you about the people I met in Venezuela, Nicaragua, in Cuba, the troika of resistance, who have bravely weathered the storm of CIA destabilization plots and economic blockades. The people I know in the Horn of Africa, from Eritrea to Addis Ababa, who have seen five million people displaced by a US-backed proxy war that few Americans even know took place. The Koreans I met, who've been separated from their own people and families by an imposed divide, who have not known peace since the genocidal US war waged on them. And the people I know in the republics of Donbass and Lugansk, who have suffered for nine years under the US supplied bombs of the Ukrainian military and its sig heiling neo-Nazi brigades, who celebrate and worship the Nazi collaborator Stepan Bandera, who murdered my own people in one pogrom after another. These people that I know and that I met on the other side of US empire, they don't care if you're right wing or left wing. They don't care if you're a camo clad Trumper or a progressive social justice activist. They don't care if you're vaccinated and masked and boosted. They don't care if you are libertarian or communist. All they want you to do is be out here today to rage against this sick, satanic, neoconservative war machine. That's what they want. Well, with certain people, you, there's very little you can do. They've been captured, and a lot of, and oftentimes they are the people who are more educated, more 
we understand what we're up against. Uh, interested in only listening to people who are credentialed. They that's partly why they fell for many of the COVID restrictions, which are now discredited because some guy got out with a white lab coat and a stethoscope, said, I'm a doctor of science, trust me. And so people who might normally be skeptical of the war state even fell for that psyop, just the same way that liberals who may have protested Bush's Republican Iraq war fell for Russiagate. We are living in what Consortium News calls a psyopacy, where the oligarchy that controls us and the corporate media that serves as its megaphone plays the role that in autocratic states, the security state might have to play in keeping citizens in line. It bombards us with one psyop after another and sucks the oxygen away from dissident, dissident or alternative media in order to make sure that the first the intelligentsia is captured and then everybody else who doesn't have time because they're so overworked in a gig economy follows. Our corporate media, which is just a megaphone for our oligarchic elite, is constantly telling us who our enemies are. They said our enemy was in Serbia when I was a teenager. Then they said our enemy was in Afghanistan. Then they said our enemy was in Iraq. And maybe our enemy was down the street in the local mosque. And we are here today to say that we know who our real enemy is. Our enemy is not in Russia. Our enemy is you, the corporate media, and the oligarchy that you speak for. Our enemy is the empire that's robbed us of our rights that's looted our treasury for its insane imperial regime change wars, and that has hounded and jailed real journalists like Julian Assange. And uh, I think one of the most important things here is that we commit ourselves to fighting a war for the American mind, that we fight for the cognitive health of our, uh, of our neighbors, engage with them, argue with them. If you're at your office or wherever you are, any community you're in, engage with people. Some of them will denounce you and be angry and some of them will ask more questions. And it's those people that will ask more questions that we can bring along. And that's all we can do at the gray zone. All we can do is put it out there. Real reporting, credible journalism that's critical of the national security state. And ask and, and allow people to do the rest. All we're trying to do is raise people's consciousness. That's our war. That's all we can do right now. And I think you talk to people here, I think we're doing a decent job against some uh, pretty powerful forces. They say we need to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them here. We say that we will fight the neoconservatives over here before they kill millions more over there. Can you dig it? That's not our war. Whether in Ukraine or the war they're planning over the Straits of Taiwan, their war is not our war. Our war is for the hundreds of thousands of homeless people sleeping in the cold. Our war is to clean up our rivers. Our war is to fix our crumbling schools and roads. Our war is to fight for the minds of our brothers and sisters subjected to a nonstop tidal wave of corporate media propaganda. Our war starts here. Our war starts today. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Thank you. Wow. Okay. okay. That was awesome. That's Max Blumenthal with the Gray Zone. Uh, again, we're uh, we're live right now on the show with Shake Up. I'm here with um, special guest correspondent Nico Kariaku. Um, we're just back from D.C. and thank you, Nico, for uh, helping us hook up with Max out in D.C. to give us that awesome interview and to see his speech to all the anti-war activists that we gathered uh, together with to try and get our message out of peace. Um, Nico, how did just? I just want your background. How did you uh, meet Max? And I know that you, there's a there's a little story you have about with him. I, I'd love you to share with us. Oh, I don't know if I've got a story, but uh, no, it's just someone I I knew from back in the college time, and uh, you know I met him through friends, and just turned out that he uh, became someone that I really look up to, and he's he's done a remarkable work, and he's a brilliant guy, and. Um, He's shed a lot of skins in his lifetime and he's come a long way. And really, um, 
you know, he, he, he challenged, uh, you know, he started with going after the conservatives, the Christian right. And next thing you know, it was Sodom and Gomorrah and he's, he's attacking the Israeli right. And, um, you know, he's been a strong anti-war voice for a long time. And, you know, it took him a second when COVID came out. Um, but he came around and he, he got it. And, and his comment there about the intelligentsia being the only ones you need to really persuade because the rest of the people are too busy trying to pay their bills, to figure out what the hell's going on. And there's no good media outlet. They don't know where to find the information. So, you know, he's dead on about that. And, and that the more educated people are, the more they tended to fall for the narrative because it was, again, framed in the context of we are science, we are rationality, we are the good guys um, against these uneducated fools that are going to, you know, infect grandma. So he, he, he came around and I, I, I hope that I may have had some impact on that by sending him some of my ramblings early on. Um, but I will, I will attest to this, Nico, when we talked to him out in DC, uh, he told us uh, that you red pilled him on COVID and he wanted to give you that credit. So well, just let you know. I I'm he's sure he had a lot of sources, but that's yeah. beautiful to hear. And I mean, I don't have a lot to say like he does about the Ukraine war. I'm sure there's a lot more educated voices on that topic. But I'd just say one thing before I think, you know, maybe letting you move on to other topics. But that's that, you know, as soon as Joe Biden got in, he went and he told Ukraine that they should join NATO. Now, this is something, whatever happened in 2014 in Ukraine, whether the CIA did the coup, I don't, I'm not educated about that, but it sounds like we were behind the, the change of power there. But that he went, that the only stipulation that, that Putin, had, I mean, Putin's had a number, but one of his core stipulations to not invade Ukraine for a long time now was don't join NATO and don't put nuclear weapons here on my border. And I think that, you know, when... Joe Biden started his presidency by going there and being like, hey, join NATO. It was like for people that were in the know, that was like him. It was like him saying, I want a war. I want Russia to invade. And, you know, the other first thing he did when he got into power was cancel all the energy production domestically here in the U.S. And it's just it's kind of and then he has all these crazy connections to Ukraine through his son and, and, and everything. It's just it's something strange going on. And, you know, this guy over here that we're supporting, Zelensky, he's not exactly, you know, a hero of democracy. This is a guy that censored all the other political parties, you know, shut down the media, banned the churches. I mean, this is he's turning to an authoritarian just like Putin. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the goal that our country is looking for in supporting this war? Because. There was a, you know, Putin apparently did offer a peace deal in December 21. Um, and the premise was that Ukraine had to be neutral. They had to roll back the NATO weapons and they had to accept this, this peace deal. And, and they had to redraw the lines. I'm not sure if it was a great deal, but the U.S., you know, made an effort to block those deals. And now, you know, next week, you know, this is a big deal. The Chinese are going to Moscow. And these are two of supposedly our biggest rivals allying as they said they would prior to the war um you know in sure in trade and, and maybe militarily and the u.s is still saying that they they don't want zelensky to make any peace deal with russia that can come out of these this 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 meeting between russia and 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 china that they can forward a peace deal why aren't we promoting any kind of peace deal why is there no diplomatic option on the table i don't understand it unless for some reason, they want to perpetuate this war, which, by the way, not only are we spending more than we spent in Afghanistan on our own war, the blood that's being shed and will continue to be shed of the Ukrainian people is going to go on for a very long time. Um, you know, and how much blood has to be spilt before our country will support a peace deal? Great questions, Nico. And we need, we need to keep asking these questions and keep investigating. 